Hey everyone, what's up? It's good to see you. My name is Caleb. This is a channel called Theophile. Here we talk about books that talk about God and we talk about them kindly. I'm glad you're here. Okay, so I've been making some videos where I summarize and present the material in N.T. Wright's six-volume magnum opus, Christian Origins and the Question of God, or Coat Cog for short. In this video, we're going to get into the third volume in the project, The Green Book, The Resurrection of the Son of God, or Trotsog for short. It clocks in at 804 pages. So in this video, I want to do three things. One, I want to talk about the structure of Trotsog, how all the chapters hang together. Then two, I want to talk about who this volume is going after. Wright really is trying to take down a couple like bad guys that loom throughout the entire project. And I want to talk about who he's writing at in this volume. And then three, I want to summarize chapter one real quickly. Okay, so here we go. First, let's look at the structure of Trotsog. It's 19 chapters long, but it's a pretty logical outline. Chapter one is an intro to the study, and chapters 18 and 19 are two concluding chapters to the study. The middle 16 chapters has three very clear movements within it. The first movement is chapters two through four, and here Wright wants to ask, what did first century people believe about the resurrection? Roman pagans, Greek philosophers, and different Jewish groups. What did the people in the first century world believe about resurrection before Christianity began? And methodologically speaking, that's just good history. If you're going to study some concept in history, you first want to back up and understand how that concept was perceived in the world before its invention in your subject. So methodologically, that's just what Wright is doing. What did people believe about resurrection before Christians came into existence? That's chapters two through four. Then five through 12 is the real heart of the book. And here, Wright has a 500 page sustained argument. It's really the longest single argument in anything that N.T. Wright has written. And in these eight chapters, five through 12, Wright asks one question, what did the earliest followers of Jesus believe about resurrection? And so he starts with Paul and he goes all the way up to Origen, who wrote around 250 AD. He's kind of considered the last theologian in that first batch of theologians after the apostles. And Wright wants to say, what did this group of people believe about resurrection? And specifically, the word anastasis or anastasis, that Greek word which we use to translate resurrection, what did they mean by that word? And so some people have jokingly said that in the middle of the resurrection of the Son of God, there's a 500 page word study. And obviously more is going on is going on than simply a word study. But there really is a long word study at the heart of this book. What did they mean by the word anastasis? What does resurrection mean? And that takes us up through chapter 12. Then chapters 13 through 17 is the final movement in the heart of the book. And here Wright backs up a little bit and he looks at the Easter stories. If this early Christian group really starts talking about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, then let's look at the accounts of that event. And so he looks at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then anyone else who claimed to have seen the risen Jesus after his crucifixion. And Wright looks at all of those accounts and claims and says, how early are these accounts? How consistent are these accounts? How mythological are these accounts? And he tries to understand how historically reliable any account of the risen Jesus is. And that's the structure of Trotsog. Okay, so now the second thing I want to do with this video is talk about who this volume is aimed at. There's really three sets of thinkers, three different ideologies that Wright is trying to take on with these 800 pages. The first kind of bad guy for Wright in this volume are secular skeptics. And this is not an old-fashioned apologetic, right? It's very clear that he's not trying to write an old-fashioned apologetic for the resurrection, where he just marshals all of the evidence and then says, look now, Mr. Skeptic, you have to admit you were wrong or admit you're stupid and believe in the resurrection, right? Is not trying to do that. He is trying to say, however, given all of the evidence we have, the sudden rise of Christianity and their belief in a solid anastasis, we can make perfect rational sense of all of the data by believing in a miracle, that something actually happened to Jesus. If you are going to take a secular position, it's hard for you to explain all the evidence. And that's his apologetic, that the secular person has a hard time explaining all of the different facets of data, whereas the Christian has an easy time explaining everything that happened. And so Wright is trying to take on the secular skeptic a little bit by just saying they can't explain all the data very clearly. But the second group of people Wright is writing against is really his main bad guy. He's not so much concerned with the atheist as he is concerned with this second group. And Wright's main concern is to address the liberal Christian. 
right wants to say to specifically John Dominic Crossan or Rudolf Bultmann type liberal Christians who say that, well, Jesus becomes resurrected in our hearts when we follow his teachings or he becomes resurrected for us when we feel forgiveness of God through him or something. Wright wants to say towards those liberal Christians that that position is just the least tenable of any of them. Given the solid way early Christians talk about Anastasis and given the claims of the resurrection stories, given the claims of the Easter stories, given the claims of the early church, that position that says Jesus didn't really physically rise from the dead, but he becomes spiritually raised when we believe in him, right wants to say that's the position that out of anything needs to be dropped. That's really the main bad guy for this volume. But then the third group of people Wright is trying to write against are actually conservative Christians. Because Wright wants to say that for many conservative Christians, the resurrection is devalued because the cross is so emphasized. And Wright would say overemphasized. And so the center of Christian piety centers on penal substitution and it's hard to fit in where the resurrection makes sense. It's kind of just a happy miracle that ties the story together. And Wright wants to say that's backwards. The resurrection needs to be the center of our theological thinking. Now, the resurrection only makes sense as the resurrection of the crucified Jesus. He must be a crucified Messiah in order for the resurrected Messiah to make any sense. But he wants to say to the conservative Christian, look, if you so emphasize the, re the crucifixion that the resurrection is undervalued, but you really believe in the historicity of the resurrection, you're actually making just a mirrored equal and opposite error to the liberal. The liberal so emphasizes the importance of the resurrection, they just don't think it happened. And Wright wants to say, well, thinking the resurrection really happened, but de facto devaluing it is equally as erroneous. So we need to treat the resurrection as a real event that has theological significance. Okay, so now in section three of this video, I just want to summarize chapter one of this volume really quickly. In chapter one, Wright tries to just clear away some of the thorns and thickets that have grown up over resurrection studies. There have actually been a lot of people who want to say resurrection studies should not be a thing. Resurrection studies books should not be allowed in the academy, and Wright wants just to address those concerns before getting into his project. And some of these voices that say we shouldn't even do resurrection studies clearly come from the atheistic secular wing. And those voices say, well, we know a priori miracles don't happen, and we know a priori, especially resurrections don't happen. Therefore, resurrection studies is like Martian studies. We don't have a Martian studies wing. We shouldn't have a resurrection studies ring wing. And Wright wants to say, well, um, we're going to study the historical data. We're going to do Jesus studies. We're going to do biblical studies, first century studies. And if all of the data in those legitimate fields of study lead us to belief in a resurrection, then we're going to have resurrection studies. I'm sorry your worldview rules that out of hand, but your worldview is wrong. We're going to follow the facts where they lead. Then there's another group of people who want to say, well, we shouldn't do resurrection studies, and those are actually Christians. Specifically, some Lutheran Christians and some different types of Catholic theologians have said, well, resurrection studies don't get people to believe in Jesus. They don't get us to faith, and faith is what saves not belief in historical events. And just beating people over the head with historical realities doesn't get people to faith, so historical resurrection studies shouldn't be considered. And Wright wants to say, yes, that makes sense. We're saved by faith, not belief in historical events. And just teaching people history can't magically inspire faith. But if there are reliable lines of evidence that, believe, that lead to a belief in the historical reliability of the historicity of the resurrection, why not write a book on that? We're not saying it magically inspires faith, but if there's lines of evidence that lead to the rationality of someone who believes in the resurrection, just go for it. And so Wright wants to say to the atheist and to the Christians who want to get rid of resurrection studies, uh, sorry, you have to sit down. I'm going to write a book on resurrection studies, whether you like it or not. And that's what chapter one is trying to do. So in the, com in the upcoming videos, I'm going to summarize chapters two through 19. Hopefully this video was helpful and I hope to see you in the next videos. Thanks for watching.